Uh, last week, we kicked off a sermon series entitled Kiss, Keep It Super Simple. And in this series, we're looking at the simple vision, mission, and focus of our church. Uh, so when we began meeting in October of 2023, uh, I believe God desired for our church to be as simple as one, two, three in ABC. One, two, three in ABC. That's, that's really what we've said. And so you can kind of see it. Our church is as simple as one, two, three, one vision, two goals, three commitments. Here, here's the thing. I, I've been in church for the last 20 years in some way, shape, or form leading. Before that, kind of in and out, not really ever apart. Um, but we want we want it to be able to be something that you can talk about, that you can remember, that you can share about. And so we we have one vision. We went over that last week. Simple Church exists to change our world. As we join Jesus, because he does the seeking and saving, we're called to join him. And we want to reach all who are far from God. We have two goals, gathering what we're doing here today and then scattering what we'll do in just a second, where we scatter all throughout the week. And then we gather together in small groups and then we scatter again because we know that we need to connect with the body of Christ and then scatter and connect and scatter. And then we have three commitments. We are followers, we're family, we're friends. We've said, listen, we want to make sure that it's as simple as A, uh, one, two, three, but also A, B, C. And so we've said that we're called to, uh, uh, at one point in our lives, admit, believe, and confess. And these are the simple components of salvation. If you've admitted that you're a sinner, you've believed that Jesus is who he says he is, and you've confessed and you've committed your life to him, then you have been born again. You have been saved. You have been rescued. Whatever Bible term you want to use, you move from death to life. And we want to make sure that we are helping people walk in that and towards that salvation. But not only are these the simple components to salvation, but they're also the same components that keep us in close relationship with Jesus, right? So as I, as I, as I turn from the Lord and walk in sin or do something that is selfish or sinful or just stuff driven in my life, it's my, it's my job to A, admit man, I, I've walked away, Lord, and I want to come back. I want to believe who you say that I am, that I'm a son, that I'm a daughter, not that I'm a, a, a sinner can't, that can't come back, but Lord, you have been pursuing me. You've been seeking me, and you want me to come back, and I want to confess my sin, and I want to commit again to you. And listen, we're a family of believers coming together to change our world as we join Jesus to seek and save all who are far from God. And we've said how sad it would be for us to look back 5, 10, 15 years and be not simple church, but complex church, right? How, how crazy it would be to look back and go, man, uh, you know, like, I mean, yeah, today we kind of have to figure out and move and do and see. And then, I mean, I, Ryan was like, maybe this is too complex. And I was like, Let's try one more time and then we'll shut it down, right? We could have tried. We could have hooked, moved things around. We could have hooked it up, but then it would have been crazy. But why would we want to be complex church 10 years down, 15 years down the road? We want to walk in these things that God has called us to consistently. And if there's a word that I think God is, is, is speaking to me and he's speaking to our church, it's consistency that we would just be consistently walking with him. How sad it would be for us to look back and realize that we missed joining Jesus and didn't truly change our world, but we built a church, right? How, how, how sad it would be is that we, we built a church and we could, we could have success in building a church, but forget that we are called to actually change our world. So last week we looked at our vision. Today we're going to look at our two goals, gathering and scattering. And we're going to be in the uh, book of Acts. The book of Acts, if you're uh, new to the Bible, it's kind of closer to the end. If you see regular names like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, keep turning. It's right after that. Uh, and if you're, uh, if you're kind of in Revelation way at the end, keep turning forward. My page is 1630 uh, uh, if that helps you. Uh, uh, maybe it would. Maybe it wouldn't. But uh, we're looking at gathering and scattering. And we gather together in large groups on Sunday mornings. We, we believe it's important, right, to gather like this, to sing, to encourage one another, to walk, to look people in the eyes and say, hey, how, how are you doing this week? How, how is this week gone? Are you, are you moving forward? But we also not only gather on Sunday mornings, but we gather throughout the week in small groups. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. These gatherings help us grow both in knowledge. Yes, we need to know some things so we can believe those things, so we can walk them out, but also authentic community. So we can be real and raw and authentic with one another. Like, you guys, I mean, I hope you know. If not, I'm, I'll say it right now. I'm a mess just as much as you are. 
I've said it, uh, I've said it a million times in the last 20, 20 years of ministry. The only thing different than you and me right now is you get to sit in those chairs and I have to stand. That's the only difference. It's the only difference. We're all trying to walk this journey out together and we need to gather. We gain strength and boldness. We're called then to scatter faithfully all over to Soto County in the Memphis Metroplex so that we can live out what God has for us. So today we'll find ourselves in Acts chapter 2 verses 42 through 47 and it says this, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over them, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place, and they shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in their homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity." all while praising God and enjoying the goodwill or favor of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Now, listen, last week we kind of looked at Scripture, and then I gave you the larger context and the smaller context. You say, Frank, did you do that on purpose? Yes, and I'll do it this week again, because as we read God's Word daily, consistently in our lives, last week I said, hey, uh, we, we need to read God's Word. We need to pray. We need to be in groups. We need to fellowship. We need to gather together. But the caveat that I normally put in that, and I said, I was speaking about me. I need this. I need this. I need this. And the caveat that I normally put in that I forgot to put in last week was this is I don't do that because I'm the pastor, right? I do that because I'm a believer. Same as you, right? We, we gather together in large group. We gather together in authentic community in small groups. We, we, we read God's word. We pray, not because, we're, not because we're in pastoral ministry, but because we believe Jesus Christ. And he's called us to obey all the commandments that he has given to us in Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. And so as you go to God's word, as you read it, you need to kind of understand the larger context and you need to know the immediate context so that you can grow in faith and knowledge. Not so you can be puffed up and you can do Bible drill. My wife grew up in church, unlike, unlike me. She grew up all in church. She, right, she's like, you know, hold your Bible. Right. I mean, I don't I've never done that. I mean, I think it would be fun. Uh, I think I'd lose uh, uh, a lot, uh, especially to her. But it would be uh, I didn't grow up that way. But but she, we need to know kind of what it's saying, not just for knowledge so we can puff ourselves up, because right, if we just eat and eat and eat and eat and it never goes anywhere, then it just makes us sick. And it's the same thing for us as believers. If we just eat and eat and eat and eat God's word and never do anything with it, if we're never reaching and seeking, joining Jesus and seeking to save all who are far from God, if it never comes out of us, then it makes us sick. Why? Because there's, there is this, there's this feeling of knowing we're not being obedient to the scripture, which means we're walking in sin and disobedience. And it's supposed to come out of our lives. So the larger context of this book of Acts is this. It's the second book written by Dr. Luke. Last week we were in the Gospel of Luke, and it's a, it's a continuation. So the first is the Gospel, uh, and it looks at uh, the life of Jesus. It contains the good news of Jesus living, dying, and resurrecting from the dead. The book of Acts starts with Jesus ascending and reminding the disciples of the promise of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, or the Guide. Now, the immediate context in, in uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47 is, is that, um, that the, the disciples have done what Jesus said. Oftentimes, people say the last words of Jesus were, go. But it's really his last words were, wait on the Holy Spirit. And as, he, as they waited in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came, the Holy Spirit then descends. Peter preaches in boldness about the crucifixion of Jesus, and he calls the people to repentance in faith. Now, I just need to kind of tell you, if you're familiar with church, if you've been uh, there a long time, you might be, okay, I get this, I understand this. But if you're like new to this thing, then I just need you to know that there's kind of a difference between the Old Testament Holy Spirit and the New Testament Holy Spirit. Not in personality or characteristics or relationship, not in who he is, but how he came. In the Old Testament, it was like, okay, over here, over here, over here, on kings, on prophets, on leaders, on uh, on crazy judges that we'll look at in a couple weeks when we start our judges series. I mean, just it kind of came upon them and they would be led by it for a season. 
and then it could go away. Now, for those of us in New Testament times, those of us believers in this room, we now have the Holy Spirit deposited in our lives, and we have access to Him. The question is, is does He have access to us? A couple weeks ago, we said, listen, we're not just trying to love more, joy more, peace more, patience more, or kindness more, gentleness more. We're not trying to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, but we're trying to yield to the Holy Spirit so that the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control will exude out of our lives. And so that's kind of how the Holy Spirit works. Now, the Holy Spirit descends on the church. It's a crazy scene, right? Uh, the people are like, oh my gosh, they're, they're drunk. Look at these crazy people, right? There's tongues of fire. Like it was a crazy scene in that moment. Tongues of fire, uh, and they're speaking in all different languages, and then they can all understand the languages. And so it's like, like Randall, if, it, if Randall was from Spain, and he spoke only Spanish, and I was from uh, Czechoslovakia, which was where my parents were, from, Italy, and I, we spoke the different languages, and then Randall began to speak. I began to hear what he was saying and everybody was hearing and they're like, oh my gosh, these people are drunk. And they're like, it's not even five o'clock yet. Right. Uh, and they're like, like, we don't no, 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 no. We're not drunk. We're, 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 we're following, we're following what the, the God's word said, what Joel said, and the Holy spirit is being poured out. And so Peter, remember the denier, the guy who denied Jesus three times, who was who who cursed at a lady at a fire, right? Hey, weren't you with Jesus? And he was like, no, I wasn't with her, right? The guy who denied three times now is preaching in boldness and power. And in that moment, it says that they're cut to the quick. They're cut to their heart. And there's a moment where now they've got to do something with what they've heard. And this uh, is where we find ourselves. Peter says, listen, uh, if, if you're feeling, that he kind of, they respond with, brothers, what should we do? And Peter says in verse 38, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. Be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise to you, your children, and to those who are far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. And Peter continued to preach for a long time. Uh, I kind of like preacher uh, preachers that preach for a long time. Just kidding. I don't. I won't keep you long this morning. But he he preached for a long time. It's biblical. Strongly urging all the listeners save yourselves from this crooked generation. And those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about three thousand and all. And that is the context of where we find ourselves of what we just read. The believers were then devoted. And they were devoted to the things that, that God called them to be devoted to. Apostles teaching, to fellowship, to sharing meals, to prayer. And then there was these unreal things that began to happen. There were some miraculous things, but then there was this deep sense of awe. Like, oh my gosh, God is using me. Have you ever felt like that before? How could he use me? How, how could he work through me? How, how could he move us in this way? They met together. And, and instead of being selfish, they were selfless. It's unreal. They, they began to be changed by what, uh, by what was happening. So today, I just want to divide this little passage of Scripture that we looked at, that we read, into three parts of the story. So first, we're going to see this. God works first. God works first. God works first. Listen, God is always at work, and He has always been at work, and He is always working first. In our relationship with Him, uh, with, with our God, He first loved us, and we responded, right? Nothing started with us first. It always starts with God. God works first. And so he's pursuing in these people, uh, as he's, as Peter is preaching, he is pursuing these people that are there and they all begin to res want to respond, brothers, what should we do? And so they they repent of their sins and they are baptized. They believe in him. Listen, he is pursuing and seeking us so that we can be saved, rescued, redeemed. And in this passage, as Peter preached, he pierced God, not Peter, but God pierced the hearts of the Israelite and Jewish people in the crowd, and they responded. They responded, and they believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some of them may have been, some of that 3,000 may have been in the crowd that just a few uh, months ago, or a, a, a little over a month, was yelling, crucify, crucify. You remember that scene? Where they're like, hey, we can, we, can, we can give you Barabbas or we can crucify Jesus. Who do you want us to crucify? And they say, give us Barabbas. And they're like, crucify him, crucify him. They might have been in that same crowd 
Now they're there, they're celebrating. There's more people celebrating the Passover in that moment and they're back to celebrate again. And in that moment, 3,000 people believed. These believers then, what scripture says, devoted themselves. Because God began to work in their life, they then devoted themselves. I just want to tell you, believers by definition should be devoted, right? In the scripture that we just read a second ago, it says all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And it says they were devoted to these four different things. Believers, by definition, should be devoted and they should be maturing. Will you say the word maturing with me? Maturing. If there's a moment in your life where you feel like, man, am I, am I, am I moving forward? Am I moving in the right direction? The answer is, is probably not. If you're asking that question, then you probably need to figure out, okay, how can I be maturing? Now listen, I'll say it a little bit later again, but we're we're always in the process of maturing. Uh, it won't be until, as Ryan mentioned earlier, when we're face-to-face with God that we will be mature. But in this life, we are always maturing. And so they were devoted. They were devoted to the things that God had encouraged them to be devoted for. So we must ask the question, to what are they devoted? To what are they devoted? Now we can read it. It says all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals and to prayer. But I want to tell you that they weren't just devoted to those things. It's not really what are they devoted to. It's really to, I don't, and this is where I get bad in English. Is it to who or to whom are they devoted to? And I don't know, and I don't need you to answer right now either. It doesn't matter. You get it, right? To who or to whom, either way, are they devoted? And it's Jesus, right? It's not just that they're devoted to the things. It's not that they're just devoted to the teaching, to the fellowship, to the sharing of meals and to prayer, but they're devoted to Jesus because they have recognized him as their Messiah, Savior, Redeemer, Rescuer. To who or what are they devoted? It's to Jesus. And so we see that if God works first, then the second thing we see in this passage is there is a response to God's work. There's a response to God's work, right? If God's always working, there's a response to God's work. Now, listen, some of you in the past have responded this way to God at work in your life. You're like, no, not willing to do it, right? You put both hands up, like the, the, uh, it's the international sign for stop, right? Uh, you know, stop, stop, right? You, you're going past the police officer and they're like this. You don't, you know, you're not, they're not doing this, right? They're doing this, right? You got to watch. Stop. Listen, some of us have said to God in the past, he starts working on us, we see and we recognize the work and we're like, no, God, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. But the recognition is in this moment, the believers responded and they said, no, come on, God, begin to move in our hearts and lives. Why? Because he was challenging them. He was growing them. They were now devoted to these things and they were growing in him. Verse 42 says the believers were devoted, uh, them, had devoted themselves to four things. I kind of put them in uh, INGs so that we can help remember them. If, you wanna, if you're a note taker, they're not going to be on the screen, uh, but I will give them to you and I'll give them to you twice. Learning, gathering, sharing, and praying. Learning, gathering, sharing, and praying. These are the things that they were devoted to. Learning, gathering, sharing and praying. No takers, you got it? Got it? Learning, gathering, sharing, and praying. Learning, gathering, gathering, sharing, and praying. Listen, we should all be note takers. I know I'm not, I'm not even, when I'm sitting in your place, I'm not, I'm just trying to listen, I'm trying to listen, I'm trying to listen, but we all should be note takers. Uh, bring a pad next time, maybe. Um, listen, because of their devotion to Jesus and his love for them, they became united. They became united in these four things. They were learning together. They were gathering together. They were sharing together and they were praying together. They became united. Uh, uh, about this passage, Kenneth Gangle says this, unity affords or provides the greatest identifying mark of the people of God. Unity affords, the word affords, we don't often use it this way, but he did, and he's, he's an older, uh, older gentleman, provides the greatest identifying mark of the people of God. You want to know how you can tell the people of God or the people of God? They're unified. They have unity. They walk together. They move. Now listen, I want to tell you, Jesus said in the upper room that the world will recognize devoted believers by their love for one another. You, we want to reach all who are far from God. We want to reach all who are far from God. We need to walk in unity. 
We walk in unity. Now listen, here's the crazy thing about unity. Look around the room. Would you look around the room? Look around the room. None of us look exactly alike. None of us in this room look exactly alike. Listen, our desire, our heart's cry is that this room would continue to get more and more and more and more diverse. And as we look around, we go, oh my gosh, they don't look like us. They don't look like us. Here's the cool thing about God. Satan tries to separate us by our division. But God, he has brought unity to you and to me through diversity. Is that not crazy? Aren't you so glad that not all of us are me? <laughs> like, I'm glad, kind of, right? I mean, I'm looking at Zach right here. Aren't you so glad that all of us aren't Zach? Right? I mean, and we could put fill in the blank with anybody's name in this room. Aren't you so glad that we are not the same? We are called to be walking in unity. And we need to, as a church, as a young church, guard that. Let me give us a word of warning. A word of warning here. It's all pink in my notes. Word of warning. That means say it. Say it. Don't skip over this. Word of warning. We are maturing and we are never mature. We are maturing and we are never mature until we see Jesus face to face in heaven. We are each on our own journey. Different places, different ages, different stages, different seasons. I want to say it again. We are all on our journey, different places, different ages, different stages, different seasons. You could be an older person in this room and be a younger spiritual person in this room. You could be a younger person in this room and be an older spiritual person in this room. Does that make sense? We're all in different places. Listen, we all learn different lessons at different times. God does not God does not just give us like a one way to grow and we walk through that and we all process the same things at the same time. Did you know that Ezekiel chapter 18 is in the Bible? You say, Frank, that's a weird statement. I read it this week and I thought, I have never read this before. I have never read this before. It is God's grace in the Old Testament. Ann and I were sitting out on our porch on, uh, uh, on yesterday. Uh, uh, on, thank you. Uh, on Saturday. Beautiful weather. Did you praise the Lord for uh, 60 degrees in July? Yeah. Uh, unreal, right? So we're sitting on the porch to, uh, in the morning. I was kind of up and settled and ready to go before Ann was, and uh, she had to catch up on some Bible reading. Uh, God's, all of us learn in different ages and stages. <laughs> uh, but so I was ahead. I was ahead, and I said this. I said, I said, do you have you have you heard about the Rechabites before? The Rechabites. And she was like, I have never read about them. This is so unreal. God, God gives us different things at different places and different stages. And he is growing us. And listen, I want to tell you, the largest danger of discipleship is this. I want you to be where I am. I want you to be where I am. Listen, yeah, of course I want you to be where I am. I want you to learn the lessons that I'm learning. Hey, let me tell you about what, what God was doing. But it shouldn't be so much that I'm like, no, you got to be learning this too, but you got to wait and be patient until God can teach us that. Some of us, as we walk through the, the, uh, the sermon series on spiritual gifts, I mean, on, uh, on the uh, fruit of the spirit, I said, some of you by nature are patient. Some of you by nature are gentle. Some of you by nature are kind, right? And so you don't, you've already got that lesson. You don't have to take the remake, like the retest, right? But some of us, we got to take the retest and some things. And listen, the largest danger of discipleship is you where I am. And listen, here's what we need to do. We need to learn to walk in forgiveness and unity. It's a big deal. In this room and in small groups and in, in every moment from our church from here on out, we need to learn how to walk in forgiveness and unity. It's a big deal. So that means I go to the person and I say, hey, I, I messed up. I'm sorry. That's how it's supposed to work. If it doesn't work that way, if I don't go and say, hey, I messed up, then, then they're actually supposed to come and look at me and say, hey, man, I think you were kind of wrong in that way. Um, do you need, to, you need to kind of like, what do we need to do to make this right and walk in unity? Listen, we must give what we have been given. And all of us, if we have believed in Jesus Christ, have been, have been given forgiveness. We have been given 
forgiveness. You say, Frank, is anything going on in the church that you're preaching about this? Why did you give this word of warning? Because here's the deal. Who knows what God wants to do in the life of our church? Who knows what he wants to do in the life of our church? And I don't want us, any of us, myself included, to be the stumbling block. You may say, Frank, do you need to apologize to Ann uh, about what you just said? Um, uh, I, I think she knows I was joking. Uh, but if not, then Ann, would you ask for, okay, I would love to, for you to give me your forgiveness. Uh, and I think that she would give it to me, right? Right? That's the way it's supposed to happen, right? Now listen, listen, we are called to walk in that. Because we're walking in unity. And we're walking in unity as we are doing these four things. Learning, gathering, sharing, and praying. So because of their devotion, there was a one-time decision that mattered to them. And they desired to live a lifetime of worship devoted to God and one another. And they experienced unreal things. Verses 43 through 47. Here's a few things that they experienced. A sense of awe, signs and wonders, togetherness, sacrificial giving of their lives and their stuff and their things. They were worshipful like you guys were this morning. Like if you can carry a tune in a bucket or you can't sing uh, for nobody's business, we are called to make a joyful noise. Amen? Amen? And bring it. We're called to worship with joy and praise. And then there's this outward thing that happens. There was goodwill is what, uh, is, what is the tr translation that I read or favor from all people. Their devotion to God was best shown in their desire to gather. They gathered in two ways, in the temple courts, and house to house, we gather in two ways, private school, cafeteria, trailer, and small groups, right? They, they probably temple courts a little bit more immaculate than, uh, than the trailer we're in today, but hey, uh, we're doing what we got with what we got. So we're moving in, in, as we meet, we're gonna do these two things. Listen, our Sunday morning worship gathering is both the end and the beginning of our week, right? It's both the end and the beginning of our week. It's a celebration of all that God has done. And it's a beginning to center our lives on Jesus Christ to say, God, you're going to be with me this week. You were with me last week. You're going to be with me this week. And we are going to scatter from here and we are going to celebrate. Listen, this is the overflow celebration right here. What we're doing of all that God has done this week. It is also the moment when we center our hearts in preparation for the next week. Small groups is a daunting step if you've never been in a group before. Or if you've been, can we just be honest here, uh, here at Simple Church this morning, if you've been in a bad group, right? We've all had a bad experience at some point. Listen, it's a daunting step if you've never been in a group or you've been in a bad group. And for over 20 years, we, myself, my wife, my kids, we have been in small groups and it's a great place to grow in authentic community and grow spiritually. Our small groups kick off this week. Here's the cool thing. You can use the Church Center app or follow um, uh, the link that is either on this Church Center um, QR code over here or there'll be one that's scrolling on the screen after the service or you can get you can go to uh, simplechurch-cc. Uh, uh, slash church center. You can, co you can contact me. We'll get you connected, but you can go to the link on the website or you can go to the app and you can connect to groups right through there. Um, and, and it literally, you go to the groups say section on the app, more groups, and then you can see which groups are meeting. We have four groups meeting and you can request to join a group. If you're not in a group at this point, we have groups that meet on Sunday night that, that in this season of life, that is the only group that has childcare. Uh, so if you want to come to that, if you have kids, you want to come to a group with child care, Sunday night, uh, our, our life group, we would love to have you. Then there is a Tuesday night young adult group. Um, I don't know where that young uh, ends, but uh, you, can, uh, you can see Cole and Madison about that and see where they, uh, where they think that ends and you can come hang out with them. And then we have two uh, other adult life groups that meet on Wednesday. Now, let me tell you, let me tell you, uh, as I'm looking at my notes and I'm trying to think about time and everything, let me tell you uh, about an amazing thing that happened this week. Let me tell you an amazing thing that happened this week. One of our groups was like bumping the 18 mark, and we meet in homes. We don't have we don't have small group space. We don't have that you know at this building. We we could use some of this space, but but we meet traditionally in homes is what we've been doing. And so one group was bumping 18. And uh, we had a leaders meeting last week and the leaders of that group were like, as much as we don't even want to say this, we probably need to multiply our group. And this week, unselfishly, 
selflessly, if you would. They said, hey, we're going to meet before we kick off Life Group, and we're just going to let everybody know that we're going to multiply. And so there were two groups that came out of one group. So why? Because they love and care for the people that are here that are not yet in a group, and they care for the people that are outside in this world that are like, don't know yet about Simple Church, but are going to find us and want to make space. Can I just say to our Sunday Night Life group, within this semester, we hope to get to the 18 mark at some point, and we would have to think about what it looks like to multiply groups. Hey, young adult life group, we've got some folks that need to join that group, and that gets to the place where it gets awkward and where people are too, more quiet than talk because they, they, it's too many people in one space, and they're trying to figure out what happens. And that group is going to have to multiply at some point. You say, Frank, oh my gosh, uh, uh, what's, what we love our group. Yeah, I do too. But the person that comes next in that door that's never been a part of group that needs one, you know what? I want them to have space. And so we're going to continue to meet and gather in small groups and multiply them and multiply them and multiply them. Because we don't gather because we have to, but because we gather because we want to and we need it. Amen? Amen. We need it. We need a place where I can have people praying for our family, for your family, for all of us, where we can be raw and real and encourage one another. And we need those. And so, listen, we're encouraging you. This week, come, join, jump in wholeheartedly to a new life group. Go to the Church Center app if you're not a part, or see me, or see Robbie. Robbie, raise your hand. In the future, Robbie, or well, now and in the future, Robbie is going to kind of be leading and directing our life groups so that we can make sure that we're moving and clicking on all cylinders. In the same way that uh, Amanda is helping with first impressions and Anne is helping with kids, we want to make sure that it's an important part, that there is someone that is kind of leading that and driving that. So in this passage, we see God at first at work. We see our response to that work. But finally, we see that God's work continues or God's continued work. In verse 47, it gives us a glimpse into how God continues to move in people's lives. It says this in verse 47, all while praising God and enjoying the goodwill or favor of all the people. Would you say the word all with me? All. all. Would you say all again? All. all. What is, who does that mean? It's not just in the church. It's all the people. It means all the people that they, they found favor with people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Listen, they devoted, uh, the devoted found goodwill and favor amongst all the people. This favor results in people responding to God's grace in their lives, intentionally inviting people to join us at our gatherings is what we're called to do. Hey, would you come and join us? Would you come and join us? Would you come and join us? Not because we're trying to grow a church, not because we're trying to do all kinds of crazy things, but because we want to be faithful to seek and say, join Jesus in seeking and saving all who are far from God. And so they were intentionally inviting people to join Jesus in their gatherings, large and small. It's part of our strategy as a church as we gather and then scatter into the unique environments homes, schools, and workplaces. Students in this room, you are going to a school this week, all week, again. <laughs> and if you don't want to, plug your ears if you don't want to be discouraged, But and for the next 35 weeks, right? <laughs> Deacon came home and said, it's a 180-day school year, Dad. It's going to be a long, you know, it sure is. It sure is. Listen. But if we walk into the place where God has us and we go, wah, wah, knuckle dragger, and it's, and it's saddening, that's not, that's not what Jesus has called us to be. He's called us to celebrate him everywhere he has placed us in our homes, in our schools, and our workplaces. And God has created us. Remember, di very diverse. He's created each of us different and given us each a different place so that God can go with us into those places and so he can continue to work through us. And then people see our faithfulness and they see our devoted life. They see us devoted to God's word, to prayer, to gathering together with believers. They, they ask you questions like, hey, what are you doing tonight? And you go, oh man, we got our small group. Instead of going, oh, we got small group tonight. Hey, we're going to our small group tonight. What's a small group? Oh, it's a part of our church where we gather together in small groups instead of just in the large group. You begin to share. Like when people open the door, are you going to walk in or are you just going to be like, well, I don't want to push them. Any... Listen, they're asking the question for a reason. Give them the answer, at least the real answer, right? And people see our faithfulness 
They see our consistent walk, not perfection. And he begins to work in their lives. And he is the one. He's the one. It says, and each day, who added? The Lord added to those who were being saved. He's the one who adds daily to the number that is being saved. We don't earn it or deserve it. So the, our danger is this. As believers, we look out instead of up. And we must begin to trust that God is doing the work in our lives despite what we see in our world currently. Right? I mean, if you, if you put your head in the world and look around, man, it's chaos. You begin to look up in the middle of that walk and you begin to see him and you begin to see people as he sees them. So we need to quit looking at those uh, around us and worrying about the task he has each of us on. So let me ask you this final question and we'll close. How consistent are you in your gathering and scattering? How consistent are you in your gathering and scattering? Now listen, uh, the old pastors would say, now you've gone from uh, preaching to meddling, Frank. You're now meddling in our lives. How consistent are you in your gathering and scattering? I'm not talking just about attendance, although there is something to attendance, right? I'm not just talking about are you making it to the gathering and the scattering, but there's something about it. Imagine watching a TV show that happened 52 times a year, only 12 times, right? And you go to your workplace and they begin to talk about the show that everybody's watching. And you're like, I, well, I didn't watch it because I didn't, I only watched 12 times. Listen, you couldn't even, like this week, we've got some announcements for October and November. Like we've got, we've got a, a one-year celebration that we're going to do and we're going to do a Thanksgiving supper. If you come just randomly, you're, you're missing. You're missing. You, don't even, you can't even get the information about what we're doing, let alone what he's doing inside of us. So how consistent are you in your gathering and scattering? Listen, we must be consistent in our walk, in our journey, in our worship, everywhere we go. Home, in our homes, with our families, in our gathering with our church, and in our scattering into our assignment. We must be consistent. I've said this word before. Uh, it's one of my favorite words. It's the word constancy. Uh, Anne's dad used it in our uh, uh, marriage ceremony. Uh, and it was, "Will you? Uh, do you pledge to be uh, to have faithfulness and constancy. Uh, and, I, and I was like, I had to look it up, right? Because I didn't want to pledge anything that I didn't know what it was. <laughs> and it's the same thing as consistency, but I like constancy better. Are we living a, a, a life of constancy where we're running after him in everything that we're doing? Listen, for those of us continuing the journey with Jesus, it's going to take this. For those of us who say we believe in Jesus, it's going to take A, B, and C. Admit believe, and confess for us to walk a consistent life. It's going to take that for all of us to continue to walk out the journey. But for those of you who are here today, and you may say, I'm on the outside looking in, Frank. I don't know about this whole Jesus thing. Listen, it's going to take you, A, B, C, admit, believe, and confess. And while, while that is not easy, it is simple, right? While it is not easy, it is simple, because you don't have to figure out a plan. You don't have to get better. You don't have to come to him after you get all your things worked out, but you come to him just as you are. And joining Jesus is both a one-time moment and it is a lifetime of continuing and consistency. And we are called to walk that where we gather and scatter. So in just a second, I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna say this phrase that I told you I was gonna begin to say after the end of the sermons instead of amen. Because uh, typically I'll say, and all God's people said, and you're like, amen. But I'm just going to pray, and then I'm going to say, let's join Jesus this week. I just believe that's something that the Lord is calling me to say, calling me to do. And so we can remember what our mission and our vision is as a church. Let's join Jesus this week. This week. Randall's going to come. He's going to give you a few announcements. We're going to wait for just a second. We're going to load it up in the trailer, and we're going to scatter from this place. Here's the deal. Only you are responsible for your scattering, right? You can't, look at, you can't look at me, husbands, and you can't say, oh, my wife, she, she wouldn't let me scatter good. Uh, she, I, I gathered, but she wouldn't let me scatter good. Wives, you can't look at your husbands and say, man, blah, 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 he wouldn't let me scatter well. Now listen, I know that there is this husband-wife thing that works and how, how you know, uh, there's, there's a biblical understanding of, uh, of uh, marital relationships and how that all works. But listen, only you can be 
walking, scattering in a healthy way. Man, I love my wife, but I can't help her scatter where she is. She's got to do that. She's got to live a life of constancy there. Are you going to do that this week? I want to pray for us that, yeah, we would continue to gather. We would continue to sing, whether the sound system works or not. Whether we got singers in the room or not, right? We're going to do that. I pledge to you, we will do that. We will open up God's word and gather together and read it and learn and be guided by it. But when we scatter from this place, it's you and the Holy Spirit on that journey. And my prayer is, my prayer is, is that we would feel that same presence that we felt just a second ago when we scatter from this place. Because he is with us. Today may be the day that you need to turn back. You need to turn back to him and run wholeheartedly. Get on your face before him sometime this day before the day ends and say, God, I give you my life. I give you my life again. And we get to run wholeheartedly this week. Amen? Amen. Father, today, God, help our hearts to be pierced like the men in this passage and the women in this passage and the kids in this passage, those who were baptized. Father, help our hearts to be pierced to the quick and may we ask, Father, what, what should we do? Lord, many of us in this room, we know what to do already. Sometimes we're just selfish and we don't do it. And so, Father, I pray that we would, we would lay down our sin and our self and our stuff at your feet and scatter from this place. And, and Father, that we would, be, uh, we would be a church that is learning, that is gathering, that is sharing, and that is praying. Father, I just want to praise you. God, none of us in this room get it 100% right all the time, but Lord, I believe that you are at work in and through us. God, you're at work in small groups saying, hey, we need to make room and make space. You're at work in, in, uh, in Ryan and Rebecca, not, uh, not like going, uh, looking at me like I'm a crazy man and being like, hey, let's just quit this thing and let's sing it. Like, and not being so, you know, just unreal with me. Father, I, I'm just, just thankful that, Lord, in the middle of everything, you're, you're at work and you're, you're creating something that only, Lord, you can get the glory for. And so, Father, I just pray that you would continue to use us in might and in power. Father, I pray that you would help us this week to scatter well and to come back and celebrate all that you've done. We love you and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Let's join Jesus this week.